Hi, and welcome to our discussion on CPTPP and the future of trade in the Indo-Pacific. My name is Erin Murphy, and I'm a senior fellow with the Asia Program. I'm happy to be joined today by two titans of the trade and negotiation world um, who will be talking to us and bringing a lot of acronyms to the table when we talk about trade in the Indo-Pacific. For those that are new to CPTPP, it is the Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement for the Trans-Pacific Partnership. And this is a trade agreement that came out of the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Um, after that, went dormant. And it's among the Australians, Brunei, Canada, Chile, Japan, Malaysia, Mexico, New Zealand, Peru, and Singapore and Vietnam. Uh, the UK joined in July 2023, and this is really meant to reduce trade barriers and facilitate trade. And so I am joined by Vangelis Vitalis, who is the Deputy Secretary of Trade and Economic and Chief, Chief Trade Negotiator with the New Zealand Foreign Affairs and Trade. Uh, Vangelis is a Deputy Secretary, as I mentioned, and he was the APEC 2021 Senior Official Meetings Chair for New Zealand's host year. And in 2023, he will be chairing the Senior Officials Process that supports the CPTPP Ministerial Meetings. He was also the Chief Negotiator who led the conclusion of negotiations with New Zealand European Free Trade Agreement, um, the comprehensive, as we said, CPTPP, and the ASEAN Australia New Zealand Free Trade Agreement and before that, the Malaysia-New Zealand Free Trade Agreement. He was also a member of the negotiating teams for the New Zealand-China FTA and the P4 Agreement. And that's a lot of acronyms that we could go into, it's but not, I'll spell them out for not. now. We are also joined by Crawford Falconer, who's the Chief Trade Negotiation Advisor and Second Permanent Secretary with the United Kingdom Department for Business and Trade. He has been in this position since 2017. Prior to this, he spent more than 25 years working on trade policy and negotiations in and outside of the government. In 1991, he co-authored a book that foreshadowed TPP and CPTPP called Open Regionalism, NAFTA, CER, and a Pacific Basin Initiative. It's taken a few years, but last month he was pleased to join the UK for CPTPP. I'd just like to remind the audience before we start this discussion that you can submit live questions through the link on the website. So, Mr. Van Gallis, thank you for joining us. Okay. Um, and Mr. Falconer, thank you for joining us as well. And in fact, my first question is to you. Prior to the UK's accession to CPTPP, the UK had FTAs with nine of the 11 original members. So why did the UK want to join CPTPP why is the market access to the Indo-Pacific so important to the UK? And from your perspective, what are the advantages of being CPP that you can get from that agreement outside of the FTAs that you already have? Uh, well, look, thanks very much for inviting me along. Uh, it's quite a pleasure to have a chat about these things. Um, in answer to your question, I, I suppose the short version is, um, but it's not only the exclusive one, is follow the money. Um, you know, the Indo-Pacific and the Asia-Pacific in this particular case is probably a more accurate description of what CPTPP and TPP in its present form is. I mean, it's got fast-growing economies in it, um, and it's a part of the world which is the most dynamic part of the world. Um, certainly, global growth has slowed a bit over the past few years, but that's still the case. So it makes perfect sense in purely economic terms for the UK now that it has an independent trade policy, uh, to want to be able to integrate itself as closely as it can into that region of the world. Um, and that's that's a very profound reason why you would do it. Um, yes, it's true, and, and it's part of the consistency of the policy that we had bilateral agreements with a number of the members of CPTPP. But the bilateral agreements are bilateral agreements. Each one's a little bit different, um, and they're all a bit complicated if you're trying to trade with everybody individually, because each one has different rules and regulations, different rules of origin. Bureaucrats, basically, when they do these things, um, try to make it as complicated as possible. So when you've got multiple agreements to manage, they're beneficial, but they're sometimes a bit difficult to find your way through. This is a coherent agreement. So it's, it's more than the sum of its parts, precisely because it's a coherent agreement that applies across all the members. So it has the strength of a unified agreement in the region 
Uh, and technical terms, you know, has unified rules of origin, has common rules um, that apply. So therefore, you're dealing with something which is, in economic terms, immediately more beneficial uh, because of that. But more important than that, it represents a strategically important move by what I would call open law respecting economies in that region to decide that they want to have that common basis to work together, both to make their agreement more attractive in the future and attract other economies to it, um, and to, over time, enlarge, if you like, and deepen the existing agreement. You can't do all of that with a series of individual agreements. They're valuable in their own rights. But this is a, this is a very powerful uh, player in the region, uh, and it's a growing, and uh, with the UK in it, um, uh, we believe that it will give us uh, an additionality that's very significant. And that goes into, if you like, the stabilization factor of having a strong rules-based element for the economies that share that together. And in a world that is increasingly threatened, I think it's actually more and more valuable every day to be part and parcel of that kind of arrangement. Thank you so much, Crawford. Uh, I think you know those are all important points to make, especially as we talk about trade, interconnectivity, supply chains, all the experiences that we've had in COVID, and also talking about post-COVID in a rules-based order. Uh, Van Gels, to you, from application to accession, the process for the UK to join CPTPP took two years. How did that process go? What did the process, what did we all learn from that process? And do you consider that a long time to exceed, or that's going to be kind of the process going forward for the other countries? Yeah, no, a, a really good question. I mean, the, maybe the first thing to say is that for, for New Zealand as the host this year, um, a key priority for us was to have the UK exceed and for us to then host the signing of the accession protocol for the UK to formally join CPTPP to become its 12th uh, member. Um, we actually had sort of five interrelated objectives. UK accession, a, obviously a key priority, a G7 economy to join this growing and dynamic um, agreement. Second, we wanted to make sure that all of the existing signatories were now ratified. And um, what was particularly gratifying to me was that Chile and Brunei um, had ratified by the time they were the last two remaining uh, members who hadn't ratified. By the time the UK joined, they had both um, ratified the agreement. And of course, for me, having been involved in the P4 negotiations, you know, Singapore, Chile, New Zealand and Brunei, you know, which was the genesis of what has become CBTV, it was particularly pleasing to have all of us ratified, welcoming the UK in. You know, so that, that was a key part of our, our host year was, you know, having the, um, having the British Minister sign the Protocol of Accession with our Prime Minister overseeing that. So a very significant moment. Um, the third thing that we wanted to do in our year was um, to take forward in a very practical way some of the work uh, that we did. And a lot of that work actually came out of um, the work that we were doing with the British as part of their accession. So, for example, looking at the digital chapter and the SPS chapter and the customs data that we all collected to make sure that it was as seamless as possible. In other words, so that our businesses could really get the benefit of the agreement. So that, that very practical element fell out of, in, to a large extent, out of the work that we were doing with the UK through its accession um, process. Look, the, the fourth area that we really wanted to focus on was there were a number of built-in reviews of the agreement that, that needed to be progressed on labour, environment and in the digital space. And the fifth area is very much on the upgrading the agreement. And again, as we were working through the accession process uh, with the UK, it became clear that a lot of the rules that we were talking about actually weren't as modern as we had hoped that some of the chapters that we had negotiated in CBTP were now eight or nine years old and so what was interesting I think was the realization that dawned on all of us that actually we need to we need to review this agreement and that, that's our our fifth priority for the year is to you know agree some terms of reference for a review now to come to your question on the UK accession I think what it says is that um, CPTPP has a lot of elements to it and in order for a country um, uh, even a G7 economy like the UK, the 11 of us needed to be confident that in a legislative sense, in a trade practice, a practice of compliance, that we were all and we all shared the view 
um, and that we could work through with the UK, whether it was on sanitary and phytosanitary standards, whether it was on customs procedures, right through to state and enterprise. We, you know, what, what did it look like? What was in the digital space? Um, that's a robust and rigorous process, and it takes time. Um, so I think that the, the two and a bit years that it took um, was a, a reasonable process. What we are going to do now, and I think we're going to really value the, the British input into this, is we're, we are going to do a lessons learned process around the accessions. You know, what could we do better? How could we work better together, the 11, now 12 of us, as we consider future accessions? But above all, I think, and I hope the message is very much that you know, we do expect aspirant economies looking to join the agreement to meet the high standards, to demonstrate that they can comply, that they have a pattern of compliance, and that we all share that view. And that's, that's the view we came to uh, with uh, the United Kingdom. So I think that the two and a bit years that we spent on that was time well spent. The two big elements of the work are around rules and disciplines. You know, how do you meet those? And then the market access negotiations, of course, where the rubber really hit the road. So keeping on the theme of accession, and this question will be to the both of you, and then guess I'll have you answer first. Um, now we're getting into kind of the meat of, of what all eyes are on next, which are the six other applicants that are looking to join CPTPP. China, Taiwan, Ecuador, Costa Rica, Ukraine, and Uruguay. Obviously, three of those countries are probably getting a lot more attention, so Costa Rica, this is a very exciting time for you. But aside from that, interested to know how the members of CPTPP will handle these future accessions, or the benefits and drawbacks to bringing them in, um, what do you expect these members to have to adhere to going forward? There will be a lot of scrutiny, I'm sure, on several of these. Yeah. So look, I think the first observation to make is that we, we clearly have a process now where we're going to absorb the lessons learnt in the accession by the United Kingdom. Um, and that is going to be a very much a, a two-way dialogue. The, the British, as, a, as an economy that's been through the, the accession process, sharing what it thinks this was like and how it could be improved. And we are interested in improvements in the efficiency of it. Um, and then, you know, how do we then think about what the accessions look like as we, as we go forward? When ministers met in Auckland, the discussion was focused very much on, first of all, let's do the lessons learned. Let's not forget that we've got to review and upgrade and modernise this agreement. And then as we look at the, the cluster of aspirants, um, there are three principles that ministers agreed that are in the Auckland Joint Ministerial Statement. The first is consensus. The 12 of us, now 12 of us, must agree. Um, the second is that the aspirant must meet the high quality and comprehensive rules and disciplines and market access expectations of the, of the 12 of us. And the third is having a demonstrated pattern of compliance with uh, their trade commitments. And that is a, a, a really important aspect of what we will be looking at. And those three principles are embedded in the Auckland statement that ministers put out. They also said that they expect the agreement to be a growing and living one, to use the language that, that ministers use there. So that, that gives us a framework in which to consider the, as you say, the six applications. And of course, we hope that others uh, will look at this and think, boy, with uh, a third G7 economy in CPTPP, this is an important growing agreement. Mm -hmm. It's going to set the rules of the game in our region. Um, it's going to kind of have its own Brussels effect, if you like, across our region. Um, we want to be part of this because we want to be writing those rules and setting out the rules and disciplines that will apply across the region and, in fact, internationally now with the, with the British in. So, Crawford, turning to you as well, same question. What are you, I appreciate your input on these six applications from these economies um, in terms of the process and how CPTP, CPTPP will look at these going forward. Uh, well, look, um, look, to be straightforward, I mean, uh, we have just joined, uh, and uh, it's great to have joined, um, and I have no reason to sort of want to give any impression that having joined, we're now going to suddenly um, have very clear and uh, controlling views on how everything should be done. I think the sensible thing is that um, you know, we are, and above all, going to be listening to the views of the members who have been members longer than we have. And as Van Gallis has said, uh, those members who are full members, we're still technically not legally a member as such until 
uh, the implementation legislation goes through all the members due processes. Um, but we're very comfortable with what he has described as being what ministers have said about what the criteria should be um, that are used in the evaluation of the memberships. I mean, they're not complicated, really. I mean, I think it's one of the great things about CPTPP that you know it's not lost in the technical minutiae. Those three principles that he mentioned um, are very clear cut um, and very important. Um, that's the reason why the UK wanted to join, um, precisely because it was a high standards agreement, um, and it was an agreement that was high standards, but also the kind of standards that were high were the, the transparency. Um, the respect for rule of law and operations. Um, all of these things are rather important as to why we would want to join this particular agreement. So if we are above it, like I think all the other members from what we can tell so far since, since we have uh, been invited to exceed, um, share that view. We want to make sure that that integrity is maintained. So there's no question that the standard that will be applied will be the high standard for future applicants that was applied to the UK. You know, you asked Van Gellis about how long it took. Um, <laughs> I have the view that in some ways, you know, the, the process was, was possibly more exacting for an applicant member than it was for the original member. Well, I would say that, wouldn't I? But, um, I think it's quite quite pro quite proper that that would be the case because they wanted to make sure that the first member that applied from the foundation didn't find it, if you like, easier to get in than than was the case for the original members, because that's not the kind of agreement it is, which will start off with high standards and will gradually debase them. No, on the contrary, um, that's the standard we will apply to these applicants and to future applicants, um, and certainly it is our view. Course the UK needs to get in, your reflection needs to be given to the lessons to be learned from that. But um, we joined this agreement for it to be a growing agreement, no secret about that. Um, and we're very happy with it as it is, that's of course why we wanted to apply. But we see it as being a dynamic agreement that grows in those three principal directions that Van Gillis mentioned. Um, and that means that we have to have members that absolutely um, clearly are viable on those on those criteria. So um, I'm sure that there'll be consensus on that and there is consensus on that. So it's clear that the UK and CPTPP, the members have set a high bar and obviously have a precedent with the UK's accession, which will, you know, I think be an example, of course, to the other applicants that are coming. You talk about high standards, quality, integrity, rules-based order. So of course, there will be a lot of questions, I think, outside of CPTPP and inside about the next applicant in line, which is China. Of course, there's a lot of criticisms about their trade practices and other things um, in terms of their economy, but they're next to be considered for membership. So obviously, there's going to be a lot of focus on this. So this question goes to both of you as well. Um, Crawford, I'll start with you, again, as a brand new shiny member of CPTPP. What commitments are you looking for China to make? Having just gone through this process, you know what those commitments are. And what are the advantages and disadvantages of having China join CPTPP? Oh, look, I mean, I, it's the same for China as it would be for anybody else. I mean, the short and clear version is that the high standards are criteria, the provisions of the agreement are the criteria that anybody will need to meet. Um, so all the, all, if you like, the, the framework of rules which is present in the text, uh, to anybody who is an applicant, it's pretty clear what all of those are, and that would require compliance with those. Um, and it requires, if you like, the ability for the members to have the confidence that when you say you're able to, to, to comply with them, that you have credibility to be able to deliver on that. Um, so any applicant that, that, that considers themselves to be able to actually meet the standard um, also needs to be able to have, if you like, um, the evidence that they will be able to do so, um, just like we do. Um, and so that, that standard will apply to anybody. I mean, there's nothing unique about that. Um, and when it comes to, if you like, the market access commitments that any applicant will need to make, 
Um, you know, it's not, if you like, perhaps as clear cut as where you have existing rules where they're written down and say, this is what you need to do for intellectual property, this is what you need to do uh, for investment, this is what you need to do for trade facilitation, whatever the subject matter is. Um, it's like you have to make very far reaching um, and reliable market access commitments. As I say, it's not so mathematically precise as elsewhere, uh, but that means that you have to have a genuinely open market uh, that has to be able to be not just nominally open, but really open so that the real market access commitments that are made are effective and they're done on the basis that it's compliant with the rules. So if you'd asked me what was the conditions that would apply to the Ukraine or the conditions that would apply to Costa Rica, well, I would be saying the same thing in response mm -hmm. to your question. Anything to add to that? Um, no, I mean, obviously, I do. I do agree with exactly what Crawford has said in the sense that um, uh, this is going to be about the the three principles that ministers identified and set out in Auckland. Um, the discussion on accessions has essentially um, landed on right. We need to learn the lessons uh, from uh, the UK process. I said we we actually do want to hear from the UK in that process, so we need to have that dialogue. And of course. We haven't yet had that, so that's going to be an important framing part. In the meantime, um, there is an information um, gathering process. Um, you know, there is an expectation that aspirants will fill out a questionnaire, that they will provide material, just as the United Kingdom did, uh, and it is voluminous material. It runs to hundreds of pages of material, of legislative, uh, of examples of legislation where you meet um, the standard. And the point that I, I do want to emphasize is this is in the hands of the aspirant. Mm -hmm. um, it is not the case that simply because you applied on this date, you will be dealt with first. There is not a sequential process to this. The guidelines are very clear by being very unclear on the point in the sense that any aspirant who has a case that meets the, the three principles, they can secure a consensus, they can meet the, the high standards, both in the rules and disciplines, and as Crawford has said, in the market access uh, as well, and they have a demonstrated pattern of compliance. That's the language that ministers use, and that's the expectation that we would uh, we would have there. Then you work through the guidelines that are publicly available on the website, just as the rules and disciplines are uh, available to all aspirants, demonstrating how they're going to meet each of those. That's in, in the hands of each of those um, as, of each of those uh, potential uh, future members. It is entirely up to them to persuade the other twelve of us that they are that they can do those things. Um, and that is, you know, I think it's the UK. Uh, discovered that is a robust, rigorous, structured, uh, and detailed. Uh, in, in some ways, it can be a very tedious process. I mean, you are literally going through, you know, hundreds of pages of legislation just to check mm -hmm. that actually, yes, you do allow the free transfer of data, or you know, your non-discrimination provision in the digital sphere does indeed accord with the way in which we understand it in CPTPP. Th those kinds of things. Those are those are big questions, and they do take time to work through but our expectations are clear and they are public. I mean, they are, you know, as Crawford has said, one of the benefits of CPTP is it is such a transparent agreement. You can look at it. It is on the web. You can sort out for yourself whether you're able to meet those, uh, those commitments, but then you need to be able to tell us uh, that that's the case. Right, and that makes sense. Um, the one unique aspect, though, is, of course, the China-Taiwan relationship. And so be interested to hear um, like the WTO, will CPTPP members consider China and Taiwan's applications at the same time or review them separately? <laughs> um, I mean, I'm familiar with the, the, the kind of the WTO modality and there was a modality also in APEC um, that allowed that process. I, I'm, we're not in a position, I think, at the moment, certainly not as chair, to be able to pronounce on, on the modality that's going to be applied on, on any of the six um, applicants. Uh, again, the principles that ministers set out, those are the ones that, that as officials we are now going to engineer into the process. Do we have consensus? Do we have agreement that the high standards can be met? Um, and is there a demonstrated pattern of compliance? And th th those are really the fundamental building blocks of any aspirant's successful application. So I'm going to continue in the theme of CPTPP and how it is working. And um, I'm going to give you another question. And then Crawford, don't worry, I'll get to you with other questions. But um, seeing CPTPP in action, my favorite topic, dairy. 
in May of last year, <laughs> New Zealand initiated. My favorite topic. Too. <laughs> it's, it's just there's nothing bad about it, um, except for this. Uh, in May of last year, New Zealand initiated dispute settlement proceedings against Canada over Canada's administration of its CPTPP dairy tariff rate quotas. A final report was just issued a few weeks ago, and it ruled in favor of New Zealand. So congratulations, I guess. I mean, I'm not taking sides. Um, but what can be expected from this first dispute settlement report? Um, do you expect the parties to comply with this decision? Yeah. No, so look, th thank you. And, and um, yes, it was, it was good to get the win. But th the observation I actually want to make is that this is the way in which, you know, serious civilized countries deal with disputes. Um, they, they don't invade each other. What they do is they say, right, uh, we do have a disagreement. We're not able to resolve it between us. So we are going to use this functioning dispute settlement process that we've agreed through this, um, that through the CPTPP. And, and that's exactly what we did. And we, we have a, a really strong positive relationship with Canada across many, many areas. This particular area, we felt very strongly as New Zealand that we were, we had negotiated in good faith, uh, uh, some dairy access um, and believed, and the panel supported that, that we were being discriminated against and could not utilise um, what had been, you know, negotiated in good faith between us. So, um, the, as you say, the panel did rule in, in New Zealand's favour and now, you know, uh, Canada, like New Zealand, believes in the rules-based trading system, believes in the rules, mm -hmm. and I'm confident that they will indeed implement it. I've just come from Ottawa and I had a really good discussion with my Canadian counterparts about how the implementation procedure now occurs. There are, you know, time frames set out, and this is the wonderful thing about CPTPP. It has a, a set time frame. It has a mechanism for the implementation and the compliance process. Um, and I'm confident that, you know, Canada, just like us, uh, will be implementing this in good faith. And um, as a believer in the system, that's, that's exactly what should happen, and uh, I'm confident that it will. If I can make one other observation, I think the other significance of this was that, um, uh, you know, New Zealand does take cases when it feels that its rights have been um, uh, undermined or otherwise um, set to one side by, by other countries. Traditionally, we've used the World Trade Organization for that. This was our first case through a free trade agreement. And I think the proof of concept is that it really worked. And, you know, we don't have the long experience that the United States and Canada have in terms of their disputes with one another, or indeed with Mexico, but this was our first, and, and for us it was a really good, uh, positive experience, and I'm confident that that will carry over into the implementation process as well. So really, really significant for the rules-based trading system to see this working, and if I may say so, really significant that a small country like ours can take a G7 economy to court, this can be resolved amicably, a panel makes a determination and then in good faith that gets implemented. I think that's a really important signal to the rest of the, uh, of the international trading uh, powers. And it's certainly an important step for CPTPP. Though it was a dispute, it was settled within the rules, and I think that's an important step forward. And, th and that's exactly what it's supposed to do. So we have rules, we have disciplines, we have market access commitments, and we have a functioning dispute settlement where we can you know, protect our rights um, and each of us can use it uh, as, as we need to. So I think very significant for, for all the good reasons you mentioned. Now before moving on to the next topic, uh, I just want to remind our audience that um, you can submit live questions through the link on the website, so please keep the questions coming. And um, I'm sure that we'll, we'll want really tough ones. Um, Crawford, I'm going to turn no. to you. So getting into other trade agreements in the Indo-Pacific region, uh, CPTPP is of course not the only one. There's also RCEP, and for those that are not familiar with that acronym, it's a Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. Um, for these two trading block blocks, why did the UK choose CPTPP over RCEP? Well, first, I'm, I'm just, just happy to say, I mean, it, it's, we like to think of ourselves as a friend of both Canada and, and New Zealand. Um, I must say, I'm, I'm greatly relieved to hear that, that, that uh, from Van Gallus that New Zealand uh, decided not to obey Canada. Um, <laughs> and we're, we're still um, that would put us all in a tough spot, really. <laughs> what a, what a thought, you know, and, um, uh, well, look, I, mean, I don't know. I, I, I can say facetiously that, that you know, why, why did we join um, CPTPP and we didn't seek to join RCEP? Um, uh, like, well, maybe, maybe there's only so many acronyms you can take uh, at one time. Um, no, I think, 
you know, look, it's it's a question of what I referred to earlier of economy of scale and scope. I mean, I think CPTPP is, with all due respect to RCEP, a, a much deeper um, and, and more advanced agreement, um, which involves core economies with a depth that, that, that really RCEP didn't seem to us to provide. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, and also it would have been a, a very complicated and resource-intensive process with us, which I think had a much larger membership, um, but something that where the relative returns were probably not comparable from our point of view at the time. Um, and so therefore the emphasis went very much on, on, on CPTPP, because I mean, it is, it is a much deeper, a more ambitious agreement. Um, and uh, it has the, the prospect, as you can see from the number of people who are already queuing up to join uh, of attracting a, a lot more interest and of potentially being much more significant. And indeed, it's, as Van Gallis has indicated already um, in this peacemaking mode, um, you know, it's got, a, it's got an effective dispute settlement approach to it, which gives it an added dimension of being a really operational agreement, um, which is, if you like, quite comprehensive in a way that I don't think that I see. But it doesn't mean to say that you know, this is a beauty contest in any way, but there's a qualitative difference to CPTPP and a strategic significance to it, um, which I think sets it apart. Um, you know, there are other, there are other agreements uh, in the region as well. And um, you know, the, the fact that we're pursuing CPTPP doesn't mean to say um, that there won't in due course be other agreements that, that you know, we might, might be interested in approaching. Um, I don't think RCEP is perhaps one that's at the first cab off the rank in that respect, um, but there are others as well. And indeed, you know, in time, we may well find that CPTPP um, starts as part of its process, um, you know, to attract interest from some of those other regional arrangements in their own right. Let's just wait and see. This will be a dynamic process. But I think it's CPTPP that has that capacity um, to make a difference uh, and, and generate interest. And that's the big reason why, why we went for that. So in terms of another regional framework, there's also the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, or IPEF. And um, the question will be addressed to both of you, but prior to CPTPP, there was, of course, TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, of which the U.S. was a great champion, and then withdrew from that agreement uh, in the Trump administration, though there was support on both the, from the Democrats and the Republicans. Uh, CPTPP has gone forward without the United States, and the Biden administration is singularly focused on IPEF, which denotes that there is trade involved, but it lacks market access, but does focus on high standards, quality infrastructure, decarbonization, and a rules-based order. Um, Crawford, I'm going to start with you. Um, do you expect, uh, do you believe that the U.S. will ever think about CPTPP? I would love to hear um, a good answer on that. But how might this conflict with CPTPP how might that conflict with IPEF's new framework, given that it has many overlapping members? Could this be collaborative? Could it be complementary? Or is this going to be, you have to be a member of this and not that? Um, well, I, I'll give you an honest answer. I mean, I don't know. Um, but I'll, I'll give you a guess for what it's worth. Um, uh, I mean, obviously, at the moment, we aren't, we're not in any sense involved in the IPEF discussions because, you know, we're, we're not invited because we're not part of part of the region that's got a very determinative regional focus. Um, and so, you know, I, all I know about what's going on is what you can read in the media, uh, essentially. So I don't have any particular insights based on understanding what the sense of direction of discussions are. But Van Gallis may, may well have that um, if you're a member of it. Um, look, I mean, I there are lots of things that go on in the world that are trade discussions and intensive trade and economic cooperation approaches between economies, they're perfectly compatible with also having trade agreements and be part of the multilateral trading system. I have the sense that at the moment, anyway, IPEF is not something that's going to have what trade policy aficionados would describe as hard market access commitments, which, of course, an agreement like CPTPP does, although it has many other things as well. Um, you know, the one thing I would say is that, you know, where there's engagement 
um, and where there's interest and there's specificity to discussion, um, you know, sometimes these lead to, to things that nobody has predicted. So it, it may well be that coming out of these discussions, um, you find an agenda that emerges where there are compatibilities. I find it hard to imagine there'd be any conflicts that come from it. I mean, because the parties to those discussions who are also parties to CPTPP are hardly incentivized to do things that are contradictory. So I don't think that's very likely. But there may well be some synergies that come out of that. And as long as discussions are, are proceeding, I think that's a really that's a really good thing. And uh, uh, you know, if, if there are more constructive and innovative ways in which say IPEF discussions and CPTPP and people say actually there's a bit of common ground here uh, that's, these are things that would have to be decided but I think everybody has an open enough mind to say well if there's something interesting that comes out of that that would make sense for both of us let's consider it of course I have no evidence to believe that that's happening at the moment or whether it will but you know, anybody who's a trade, a trade uh, policy hack um, or indeed or more augustly uh, foreign policy specialists would always say, keep, keep the dialogue going and, and, and see what comes out of it. I mean, I would, I, you know, I don't make any secret of it. I think it would be, it would be great if one day the United States um, was interested uh, in, in joining CPTPP. Um, you know, because of all the things that we've talked about that are what the agreement is about, have been things that the United States um, has been very strongly in favour of. Um, so, I mean, that would be great. Um, it's quite clear that at the moment that's not something that the US is seeking to do. But I think with a, with a strengthened CPTPP, um, you know, it may well be that there's a demonstration effect there, um, which, which is worth reflecting on. Um, and, and we'll see over time. That's part of the reason why CPTPP itself, if you like, deepening its own agreement um, and, and how it can expand in the future, um, I think the best way in which you, you prove the value of something is by showing that it's growing and attracting interest. Um, and I think now more than ever, what CPTPP provides by way of economic security, the rule of law, a market-oriented system, is what the international system wants. And I think maybe as circumstances around the world um, put some of those things at risk more and more, whether bilaterally or multilaterally, I think the value of this agreement will become more apparent. I mean, that's how we see it. That's why we wanted to join it. And indeed, unhappily, events have uh, shown that the strength of this is, is, is even stronger than we might have imagined. So over time, you know, maybe perceptions will change. Um, we'll see. But um, that's part of the reason why we have to maintain those high standards. Because that, at the end of the day, that is what, what will make this agreement work and will attract whatever members um, in future. Any further thoughts? No, I mean, look, I absolutely agree. I mean, it was a source of immense regret. And if I think about my, you know, <laughs> a trade hack, um, <laughs> my, my entire career has been informed by US leadership in this space. And, um, you know, if you think about some of the rules and disciplines that exist in CPTPP, they do reflect, um, you know, some of those really keen interests that the, the US brought into the negotiations as we took it from P4 into TPP. It's now CPTPP, and it is, you know, uh, make no secret of the fact that it's a source of immense regret uh, not having the US um, there. I think Crawford's right. We're, we're all realistic about, you know, the, the context domestically, the context internationally. Um, and I think that's what makes IPEF a very important um, uh, other kind of building block out there. It is different to CPTPP. I think it is important um, uh, to be clear that CPTPP, as Crawford has said, that does offer commercially meaningful economic market access. Uh, that is really important to the CPTPP membership. I actually believe it's very important to the IPEF membership, but is unfortunately not part of that, um, that process. What IPEF will do that I think is very important is it will build confidence and trust amongst those that group of economies. And I'd like to think that there is a way in which the two um, you know, pieces of architecture in the region, if you like, can be mutually reinforcing. Um, and to think specifically, if you think about the very interesting things uh, in a norm building sense that uh, IPEF is doing, for example, in supply chain resilience, if you think about the, the structures that they've put in place, how to respond to an emergency, how we might all work together, I think those are very interesting aspects that certainly when we think of the review that's coming up of CPTPP, 
we might want to be having a look at some of those elements of IPEF and you know, how we're building confidence amongst each other and take over some of those lessons and put them into the hard rules, you know, the hard rules architecture, this binding you know, uh, dispute settlement mechanism we have and you know, take those up. There's a long tradition in the region of using APEC uh, and now IPEF, this, these norm building institutions that build confidence and trust amongst ourselves and then picking those up in the, in the hard rules pieces of architecture. So I do see a really strong symbiosis between the two. I'm really, um, I think it's vitally important that the United States is, is actively engaged in our region in this piece of architecture. We're strongly supportive of that. Uh, even though there are differences, there are certainly ways in which we can make those things, as I say, uh, mutually reinforce one another. I, I do think, though, it is important to remember that the CPTPP, the rules and disciplines, for example, on state-owned enterprises, on uh, some aspects of competition policy, for example, th those have a force because they are that binding element um, that unfortunately IPEF um, is not going to have. Uh, but again, the way in which the two regimes, if you like, work together, I think will be a, a really interesting case study of interoperability and mutual reinforcement. It remains to be seen, of course, at APAC that will be coming up in November. We expect to have the four pillars of the IPAF framework yep. negotiated, so we'll see what happens after that. Exciting times. Very exciting. So uh, we did get some questions from the audience, um, so I will turn to that and not pummel you anymore with mine. Um, but this actually related to the U.S. and CPTPP. Um, if there came a time when the United States was interested in rejoining CPTPP, would New Zealand and other members be open to making changes and updates that would bring this agreement closer to the USMCA, of course that's between the US, Mexico and Canada, with respect to labor and rules of origin commitments? So I think, um, I think the answer to that is we're, we're in an, an ongoing process of updating and upgrading the existing agreement. Um, I think if uh, the United States was to find a way to, you know, to become an aspirant, to uh, submit an application, that would certainly be one of the conversations. I like to think actually that what we're going to be doing through the review, you know, as I said, we're chairing this year, we're, we're going to, I hope, uh, ministers will be able to agree in terms of reference for the review. And I think that review will take us out into some of the areas, you know, if you think about where we're going on, if you think about where the existing chapter on good regulatory practices, um, the existing chapter on competition policy, and you think about some of the work that's done, been, been done, for example, in IPEF in good regulatory practice, um, you know, there's lots to learn from there. And I think what you'll see is the agreement will continue to upgrade and develop. If you think about where we got to in environment and labor, and you think about where IPEF is at, there's, I don't think there's any doubt that some of us in CBTP will be thinking, well, there are bits of this that are going to need to be adjusted and modernized to reflect our existing, you know, kind of new practice, which is not the way it was eight or nine years ago when we first concluded those chapters. So I think that there is certainly a pathway into which this agreement is going to much better fit uh, the way in which the, the, the ongoing evolution of um, what we might call US trade policy. So in a similar vein, and either of you can take this, um, on auto rules. So uh, one of the arguments for, uh, that the US put out there for withdrawing from TPP was the auto rules of origin. Um, if the U.S. should decide to re-engage CPTPP, would the members be willing to strengthen the auto rules of origin in the agreement, or is this something for further discussion? I think you better ask someone who, who has a manufacturing base that delivers. Mr. Falconer, I think this question is for you. Crawford, would you like to take this question? On well, look, I mean, are you, are you acting on behalf of the U.S. administration? Because, I mean, it would, it, you know, I think it would be fantastic if, if, if I was hearing from the U.S. administration, you know, we'd really like to come and join CPTPP, but you need to, you need to talk about auto rules, environment and labor. Uh, you know, I mean, These are questions you know, for the audience, not me. I'd, I'd be up for that discussion. Um, I don't, you know, uh, but I, I haven't heard that yet. So, I mean, uh, as a negotiator, you know, I want to keep, I want to keep my powder dry unless and until the U.S. comes along and says that's actually really the only thing that's keeping us out of CPTPP. <laughs> yeah. I'd be interested and in I, that I too. Suspect, yeah. I suspect, I suspect the other members would feel the same way. Okay, so I'm, I'm, I'm being a bit, a bit smart about it. Um, you know, I mean, 
so it's hard it's hard to answer that question in the abstract um you know i i don't get the impression at the moment that you know the us has got two or three issues which if only they would be a little bit different but in negotiation things, things would change um i think it's more more you know more fundamental than that but i mean it would be great if, if these things were to break down and there would be some kind of more constructive discussion about what the differences were at, at some point in time um so i mean there's all all sorts of hypothetical things that one could imagine with anybody who wants to apply as to what the thing is but until you have something concrete at the end of the day you, you can't really make a serious a serious observation until you've got something concrete coming the other way but it would be great if we did uh, i'm sure thank you for that and uh no i am not shilling for the u.s government here or the auto industry, <laughs> the auto industry yeah. I, I i'm just a, a lowly moderator here um so speaking of my lowly moderatorship um we'll take one more question from the audience and then we'll give you each a chance to give some concluding remarks um, the last question that we have is, uh, Van Gels, you mentioned that New Zealand and Canada were able to resolve a trade res dispute through CPTPP, through the rules, there was a process. Uh, I think you mentioned this in your remarks, but do you see this trend continuing where CPTPP is more effective than larger institutions like, say, the WTO? Um, so so I, wouldn't, I wouldn't go as far as that. I mean, I think what I'd make a distinction of is that um, the, the commitments that we negotiated in CPTPP, they are the ones that we can enforce through the dispute settlement mechanism in CPTPP. There are other commitments and obligations that other economies might have that we would need to pursue through the World Trade Organization. Um, so I think that the important point is that CPTPP dispute settlement applies to what, what's going on in CPTPP. So the, the dairy tariff rate quota administration procedures, they were negotiated <laughs> in agonizing detail <laughs> Um, in the in the negotiations, um, and they are the ones that we can use the dispute settlement mechanism to um, to enforce our our rights and obligations. Uh, so I wouldn't make a difference. And, and I mean, if I may say so, for New Zealand, the World Trade Organization and a functioning dispute settlement mechanism there is an absolutely critical part of a functioning uh, rules-based trading system. It is a really important. We we are a user of that system. We have traditionally been a um, a user. And we've used it against big economies, you know, where there's a significant asymmetry of power. And this is the way in which small economies are able to protect their rights. And, you know, that's, it gets us away from the, you know, the, the kind of the rule, realist world of rule of the jungle, uh, mm -hmm. which leaves, you know, the overwhelming bulk of the WTO membership uh, adrift. Uh, so it is really important that we have a, a, a revitalized and a functioning system. Uh, it does need reform. It does need change. But we do need that system. Uh, in place, and there's an opportunity um, early next year at the WTO ministerial um, to really crack some heads and, and try to bring that together. But I do see, that, see them as a different, but again, as a, as a reinforcement of the wider message, rules matter. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is a fundamental value that I think we all share in CPTPP um, and certainly between Canada and New Zealand. Excellent, thank you. So Crawford, I'm going to turn to you for some concluding remarks. Anything that you'd like to share with the audience? Um, look, I mean, just just a few observations. I mean, again, we are the new kid on the block. You know, we've just joined, so I think it's. You know, I think we'd like to take a little bit of time to reflect. But having said that, I mean, I think this is a really significant strategic agreement, um, and. Uh, it's become, I think, more important uh, in a post-COVID and a much more dangerous world um, to actually have something which can incorporate medium, small, and large economies um, into, into its framework. There's nothing else quite like it um, as, as, as far as an agreement is concerned. And, and as you've been hearing, I hope, this evening, um, it has the capacity to grow uh, and to deepen in future, I mean, the real question is, you know, why why would there be any reason to believe that those economies which can live up to those high standards, those con economies which can comply with the provisions, those economies which have a track record of complying with those, provisions, you know, wouldn't in due course see the advantage of joining? And you know, with the UK joining from outside the region. That doesn't need to be something that's only inside the region, it seems, in principle. 
And it's for the members to decide this. I can talk about what I see as possibilities, but obviously at the end of the day, it will depend on what other economies decide to do um, and, and what the membership can have consensus on. But, but given that there has been pretty solid consensus to this point about what those criteria mean in operational terms, that were applied to the UK, and, and it was pretty clear in the time to negotiate. There was never any real debate at the beginning of the process as to whether the UK basically fitted those criteria. Um, and, I, and there are other economies out there which clearly are in that position. It's up to them to decide whether they want to whether they want to join or not. But you know, I, I, I think I think this is a dynamic element in the future. And you know, we're talking medium to long term. We need we need to be looking in a an increasingly dangerous world where supply chains are being more and more fractured and fragmented, um, where there's less and less confidence and trust in trade flows, where there's less and less confidence and trust that people will play by the rules, that they will be transparent, um, that they will not adopt what I would call a more strategic approach to controlling exports and supply chains and be disruptive. You need now more than ever the economies who feel that way to find ways to converge. And CPTPP seems to me to be a fundamental node for that convergence. That's a kind of objective observation. I can't advocate for that or what it means in terms of future membership because that's up to the members to decide. But I think, I think it's there and that it could have that function. And so therefore the way in which in future this evolves, I think goes beyond ultimately individual members joining. It will go to a more global question about where economies converge. And I see that as a plus for the international system. It's not a substitute for the WTO. I mean, the WTO, of course, as primacy is a multilateral institution and, and for where it can reach agreement. But you need to have an agreement which goes beyond where you can actually have convergence on the modernization of rules. And uh, I think this agreement is crucial to that. And it's crucial within its members, but also in terms of what it can contribute to connecting with other parts of the economy where there are arrangements in place and economies in place which would want to be associated with it. So I, I, I think it's a great prospect. Um, I would feel that way because I spent you know, over a year negotiating to get in there. But I, I, I think it's a bit, I think it's a really good deal. Great, thank you. Anything else? Yeah, look along a very, very, very similar lines. Um, if you think about this very turbulent world that we're in, you know, the effects of COVID continue to linger. Uh, we have a war underway. Uh, we have uh, the looming challenge of, of climate change, and we have, you know, a crumbling uh, global system. Um, and that rules-based order that we've counted on and have taken for granted uh, is certainly uh, severely challenged. And I think into that space, you have this new piece of architecture, which actually isn't as new as people imagine, um, but it is a piece of architecture that is growing, it is dynamic. The UK's membership, you know, as a G7 economy, joining it from outside the region exactly as Crawford has said, I think that is very significant. Um, and if I may say so, when we drafted the CPTP language on accessions, we were very careful not to make it regional. Uh, so it's actually really important to look at the language that was used. We did have a vision when we were sitting down um, trying to you know, sustain CBTP that it was a global agreement, that it, would, that it could attract members from outside, um, outside the region. And so it's proved. And so I would certainly um, expect that we're going to get a growing interest, um, that this is going to be something of a, um, you know, a, a piece of architecture that grows, is dynamic, um, and sets some real building blocks out there. Certainly um, supports the World Trade Organization, but it has WTO plus commitments. And that ability to, that mutual reinforcement of that as we grow the agreement, modernize the rules, I think is going to be so fundamentally important. And look, look at the economic challenges we all face internationally. Trade absolutely has to be part of the, the solution. Think about its contribution to productivity, its contribution to incomes, its contribution to employment. It is a key driver uh, of all of the growth elements that we're all looking for in our economies. And CPTPP provides for businesses the confidence, the certainty, the transparency that they need to do business um, and that they can be sure that they can be protected, that you know, if they feel that they're being cheated or done down, 
um, there is a mechanism through which they, we can enforce and protect their rights. Look, I think it's a really important piece of symbolism, but also in substance. It, it is a game changer, I think, across uh, the region. I do think it is very significant, not just that the UK has now joined, but that we are about to upgrade and modernise the agreement. I think that is going to be a very, very significant process that we look to you know, push out what it is that CPTPP uh, does, what it covers, what it addresses, and that it reflects the interests of the 12 of us, plus any new aspirants uh, that we might bring in. There's definitely a growing realization of the importance of economics and trade on everyday lives. That's something that's most certainly become apparent with how governments are looking at agreements, their foreign policy, national security strategies. They talk about economic security, but the everyday private citizen also is having a growing understanding of how this impacts their lives, which makes your work that much more important. So I want to thank you both for joining us. Crawford Falconer, thank, thank you. you for beaming in and staying up so late. And Vangelis Vitalis, thank you so much thank for you. joining us here in the studio. Uh, thank you Your to pleasure. all online who joined us. Um, this session will still be on the CSIS website for you to look at. And thank you for joining us today. Thank you.